Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani and you're watching Daily Debrief. On the show today, from Brazil, we get the latest from our reporter on the ground, Zoe Alexander, in a run-up to an important, vital election, a presidential election there. And we look at why opposition and pro-democracy forces are rallying in Pakistan and Iraq. On Sunday the 30th, Brazilians will vote in a runoff election that might mark a significant shift in the road for one of the biggest nations on the planet. Climate activists are saying the fate of the Amazon, the world's largest rainforest, depends on it. And Brazil's massive working class and poor have come together in support of the Workers' Party candidate, former President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva. Latest polls show Lula holding a very decent, but not massive, six-point lead, with three days to go before polling. Incumbent Jair Bolsonaro and his far-right support base have been upping the ante since the first round of results put the two in this runoff election, leading to a volatile month of October. Zoe Alexandra has been in Sao Paulo during this time and has this to report. How are we reading the numbers, Zoe? Well, it's a very exciting week here in Brazil. Um, there's just five days left till the big day, October 30th, where the Brazilian people are going to elect who's going to be the next president. The numbers are looking very tight. I think one thing that was very interesting about the first round is that while the polls had predicted accurately what kind of numbers Lula would be getting from 47% to 49%, which ended up being right, the predictions for how much Bolsonaro was getting in the first round was vastly different. This round, the latest polls are still showing Lula pulling ahead in the second round, winning with um, anywhere between a six and two point difference. We're seeing uh, a lot of different numbers, but all of the polls that came out yesterday still show that Lula da Silva of the Workers' Party would win against Jair Bolsonaro. But I think it's important to point out that it is extremely close. Um, and while the margin of error is between one and two percent for a lot of these polls, as I mentioned before, the first round poll results compared to the final results of the elections showed that really the polls can only give you so much of the picture and the question of abstention in Brazil, the question of blank ballots is a huge issue. And that definitely impacts how the polls actually play out in um, in the run up to the elections. Right. Uh, it's been a bit of a volatile month, uh, Zoe, the month of October since the first round uh, results came out. Uh, tell, tell us a bit about that before we uh, sort of round up with what the key talking points are at this late stage uh, before the final voting. That's exactly right. I mean, as you said, it's been a very volatile month, very focused on fake news, very focused on um, a battle on social media, spreading different um, rumors or resharing old interviews and putting them in a new context. Um, we've seen accusations of uh, Lula being satanic, that he's going to ch close the churches. Um, there's been so much really bouncing around. But I think the main the main thing is that it's all been taking place on social media and having a much less emphasis on programs, on proposals, on concrete solutions, and really much more about um, creating discourses of hate, creating discourses of volatility, and trying to really tap into this emotional element of the elections, which is, you know, of course, unfortunate, because as we've said on this show, Brazil is living one of the worst crises in its history. Um, and yet, Bolsonaro, the current president, would rather focus on uh, saying that Lula is going to close churches, which is, of course, a lie. He actually created the law of religious freedom. Um, so that's what's going on. And even in this past week, there's been a huge polemic because a very strong Bolsonaro supporter, Roberto Jefferson, uh, he had been spreading a lot of fake news. He's been constantly attacking uh, members of the Supreme Court. And his house arrest was revoked because of a video that he published on his daughter's social media page, calling one of the Supreme Court justices a witch, a whore. All of these horrible words, misogynist, um, questioning her ruling. And because of that, his house arrest was revoked. Military police went to his house to arrest him. And mm. he responded by shooting at them 20 times with a rifle and throwing grenades at them. This is the level of uh, intensity that we're living right now in Brazil, there's a very high level of volatility. People are very anxious about violence. And of course, it has to be underlined that this is also a strategy of the far right to yeah. dissuade people from voting, to dissuade them from participating, dissuade them from campaigning. 
one of the campaign activities in the northeast of Brazil was interrupted because of gunfire. So this is the situation on the ground. A lot of tension, a lot of fake news, a lot of social mm -hmm. media battles and less focus on the real issues facing the Brazilian people. Uh, we've uh, on Daily Debrief and, and on People's Dispatch in general, Zoe, we've covered uh, all of the issues that workers in Brazil and the working class and the poor are facing consistently. But one of uh, the key elements of this sort of uh, political battle that has emerged is the future of the Amazon rainforest and, and the focus on climate. Uh, so maybe Lee, uh, with that, you can sort of summarize where uh, the discourse is at, if any. Definitely. I mean, as we've seen in the past couple of years since the coup against Dilma Rousseff with the assumption of Michel Temer as president, and then, of course, much intensif uh, intensifying after Jair Bolsonaro took presidency has been the um, deforestation of the Amazon and the horrendous impact that this has on the environment. Uh, we published an article from Brasil de Fato, which actually overlaid an electoral map on the map of deforestation of the Amazon in the high concentration of environmental crimes involving illegal mining that happens in the Amazon. Essentially under Jair Bolsonaro, all of these activities which attack the Amazon rainforest, which all of us know is such an important uh, element of the ecosystem, not only for South America, not only for Latin America, but for the world. Um, mm. This is He's given a free hand to these people. These are his major political allies. If you look at this map published by Brasil de Pato, it shows that the major areas of support for Bolsonaro, where he was able to actually get over 70% of the vote, are exactly where these people are, are concentrated, who are committing mm. these environmental crimes, who are trying to get this uh, political support to be able to do illegal mining, um, to steal lands from indigenous people, to steal lands from the native people of the area and to essentially destroy the rainforest. And we know that this is going to have huge impacts, especially while climate change is accelerating in other areas. Um, the impact on drought, uh, this is gonna be really, really important. And Lula and all of the other candidates, of course, in the first round had called for a complete end to illegal deforestation, a complete mm. end to all illegal uh, environmental crimes in the Amazon. Bolsonaro, on the other hand, has very strong ties to these uh, people, he says that um, there's, it's it's kind of a conspiracy the way that the indigenous people have uh, have conservatorship over parts of the rainforest, and this is all just to attack Brazilian agriculture, and that it's important to open up the Amazon for logging and for other agricultural activities to make Brazil more productive. We of course know this is not true. Mm. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Zoe, for your continued reporting from Brazil. And of course, uh, we will uh, join you again uh, as and when the elections do take place. Uh, good luck for, for the rest of the week. Thanks so much for having me. Former Prime Minister Imran Khan, leader of the Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf party, has rallied his support base for what he's calling the largest long march in the history of the nation. The rally will begin at Liberty Square in Lahore, in the province of Punjab, and make its way to the capital, Islamabad, a distance of just under 400 kilometers. The demand is quite simple, immediate general elections. Abdul, fresh uh, political turmoil in Pakistan. Uh, we were talking about it briefly earlier. Uh, what, what exactly is going on? Why is uh, Imran Khan and the PTI staging this march from Lahore to Islamabad? Uh, there are two things. Uh, uh, Imran Khan, one, he, what he said during his press conference uh, yesterday, uh, talking about his disqualification from his uh, member of parliament seat mm. uh, by the Electoral Commission in, in Pakistan. Mm. That is one reason, of course. Uh, this we, we should see as the long uh, drawn battle which is going on between the uh, uh, state uh, particularly the present government and the PTI in that. That is one. The second thing is he also, during his Oxford uh, uh, Union lecture, he also mentioned about the, uh, the killing of a, a journalist, uh, which was considered to be one who was primarily questioning the government again and again mm. on the issue of um, uh, the links between uh, the U.S., and uh, uh, the uh, military and other establishment in Pakistan, which b ultimately led to uh, the vote of no confidence in April, where he had to kind of resign from his post. So uh, he was killed. The journalist who was in uh, UA UAE had to go to, for some circumstances, had to go to travel to Kenya, where he was assassinated. Right. So he's blaming 
his assassination uh, on the uh, current establishment. So keeping both these in mind, and of course, uh, he's basically saying that uh, these are signs that the present establishment has lost the confidence of the people and it is time for the fresh elections in Pakistan. Mm. So with the demand of the immediate announcement for the fresh election, mm. he's, has announced, he has announced the march mm. on from beginning on Friday mm. uh, to uh, Islamabad, from Lahore to Islamabad. To Islamabad. What sort of support Abdul has he managed to garner in this process and, and what is the overall political scenario looking like at the moment? If we see there are two by-elections which also Imran Khan also uh, proudly refers to mm. during his Oxford Union lecture. Uh, in the two elections which has happened, uh, both the elections were won by uh, uh, Imran Khan's party, Punjab state election and other uh, by-elections. Uh, he uh, that he, according to him is a sign of uh, uh, the popularity yeah. the PTI is right. enjoying. He is also mentioning uh, the 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 huge popular mobilization which his party has been able to uh, uh, kind of do uh, in last uh, six months, uh, roughly six mm -hmm. months. Um, so whenever the PTI has given a call for demonstrations or marches in the past there had been a huge uh, popular uh, participation in it and in this the upcoming uh, 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 march also he is claiming that this will be quote unquote the historic march which has never happened mm. in in pakistan mm. if we uh, see it objectively also there of course there is a, a by and large a popular mood mm. in favor of imran khan for various reasons mm. i think we have talked about this in this show right. uh, many times yeah. one of the major reasons is the overall Im image uh, he has been able to create mm. in the minds of the people about being uh, a person who has uh, kind of uh, carry performed on certain issues this performance, of course, should be seen in the context of the COVID yeah. uh, and also uh, the failures of the present administration, uh, particularly because of the IMF uh, pressures, mm. which has led to uh, reducing of subsidies on uh, at a time when the common Pakistanis are yeah. suffering because right. of the price rise right. and so and so forth. Floods, so uh, floods, exactly. Mm. So in that context, of course, uh, what uh, for a common Pakistani, uh, the uh, the time of Imran Khan looks much more uh, relatively uh, better, better than better. what is today. Also, we should uh, see that the, the image he has been able to create as a, uh, of a martyr, mm. uh, given the fact that he, that the, the, the US role in mm. his uh, uh, no, no confidence vote against him mm. has been, has become a very popular uh, 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 kind of slogan mm. uh, for the common Pakistanis, mm. given the uh, long term uh, kind of uh, skeptic approach towards Pak uh, towards the US and US uh, hostility towards the US because US, ha as we all know, since 1947, US has been one of the basic external elements in Pakistani yeah. politics, yeah. which basically people do not like it mm. because it's led to the death of th thousands of Pakistanis, mm. destruction of the economy. Mm. And Pakistan has become a, a kind and of hub. And also fueled the military industrial complex that exactly. kind of runs the entire country. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So that is the basic so, uh, reason. Yeah, very quickly, just to sum up, uh, what is the sort of likely uh, reaction to this march going to be? And uh, are we sort of, is the possibility of elections in the near future something that, that we are uh, looking at? Uh, it is not that likely. Al uh, Prime Minister uh, said uh, immediately after what Imran Khan, uh, Pakistani Prime Minister said that the elections will happen uh, in next year, uh, whenever it is scheduled. Right. And uh, uh, there are uh, though, uh, there are possible. Imran Khan said that the march will be peaceful, hmm. but of course there are possibilities of uh, violence, particularly because the state will try to prevent the mar uh, protesters, marchers from entering uh, the capital. The capital. And finally, three years from a popular youth-led uprising and elections that followed in October of 2021, Iraq has been more or less in a state of political paralysis. To mark the nearing of the end of the month of protests back in 2019 that left 600 dead at the altar of change, change that ordinary Iraqis have not seen enough of since then. 
Despite some recent positives, the key demands of the movement that began in Baghdad's iconic Tahrir Square remain, uh, remain constant. Thousands gathered to chants of the people demand the fall of the regime, a rallying cry from back in 2019. Uh, Abdul, scenes uh, from Baghdad that we're looking at, at least particularly the Green Zone and uh, Democracy Bridge, I think as it's known, uh, leading into that Green Zone area, which of course was the center of uh, you know the occupying forces or the, the U.S. forces when they were in the country. Uh, going back to that kind of police barricading, security, traffic jams, all of that uh, scenario, uh, three years on from the uprising, what is the current political status in Iraq? Most of the demands, I, we should start uh, with that, most of the demands which the protesters raised in 2019 uh, uh, remained unfulfilled. They're not, I think there is no all, uh, political will also to kind of address those. And that is the one thing which defines today's politics in Iraq. Um, uh, the people who gathered on uh, Tahrir Square, uh, uh, I tried to also march to the Jamhuri Bridge mm. or the uh, Bridge of Democracy, whatever it is called. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, there is a disappointment, uh, particularly from the uh, among the young uh, youth population in Iraq, which mm. is uh, more than 50% of the mm. Iraq's population mm. has not seen uh, uh, any... Uh, uh, realization of potentialities yeah. Iraq, Iraq has, given yeah, the fact yeah, yeah. that it is one of the largest uh, exporters and depositors, uh, has a largest reservoir of oil in the world, uh, which is a hot commodity at this uh, moment. Mm. Uh, so, uh, the, the anniversary, uh, on the anniversary, there were attempts to kind of reignite uh, the protests which happened in 2019. Of course, it did not uh, uh, come through for various reasons, mm. primarily because of the exhaustion and all. And also, uh, there is a slight uh, uh, kind of uh, political uh, change at the at, at at the top level, which is happening. Uh, in last few months, Iraq has seen different kinds of protests, not the kinds of protests we saw in 2019. 19, right. This was uh, primarily between the Sadr's uh, supporters mm. and uh, the people who opposed it, mm. which ultimately has now has led to the re real uh, election of a new president. Mm. Uh, uh, designation of a new prime minister. The prime minister who was opposed by Sadr uh, is now the uh, designated prime minister in Iraq. So given the uh, circumstances, uh, the political circumstances in the country, mm. uh, the, the, the urge for the uh, re-emergence of the kind of protests we saw in 2019 is not that uh, uh, strong. And that, that basically led to a, a low, low key uh, demonstration, uh, kind of uh, demonstration commemorating the third anniversary, which happened uh, on Tahrir uh, on uh, uh, Tuesday. Hmm. And uh, by the way, Tuesday won one, but there were uh, throughout the month there had been demonstrations Multiple. commemorated yeah. because this is uh, the A Tishreen process. movement, October uh, revolution, Maybe. as yeah. the people say. say. All right, uh, it was uh, an uprising that sort of had significant human toll, over 600 people were killed. Uh, what were sort of the key factors? You, of course, pointed out that Iraq is uh, resource-wise a rich country and the people are not seeing any benefit of it despite intervention from the West and all of that. Uh, so, so what are they looking for and, and uh, politically does some kind of uh, solution or uh, answer lie in the offing in some the basic reasons behind the protests in 2019 uh, were primarily, if we, for the mat, uh, for the sake of simplification, to make it easy for us to understand, mm. were uh, primarily three. Of course, uh, uh, the economic conditions were the driving force. Yeah. The the governments which came, the system, in fact, which came into existence after the U.S. invasion in 2003. Mm has failed to deliver on the basic uh, uh, economic issues in Iraq. Uh, 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 given the fact that Iraq, as I, uh, we said before, Iraq is one of the richest countries on the globe yeah. when it comes to the economic resources. Yeah. Uh, the poverty is, in, is increasing, the unemployment is unprecedented according to the UN uh, data, around 35% 
of the youth population, which mm. is, as I said before, 50% and half. more. Mm. Uh, uh, there is 35% unemployment among the youth in Iraq, and particularly those who are graduating. Mm. They are not able to find jobs. jobs. So, uh, apart from that, the, uh, the supply of basic services like electricity, water, sanitation mm. is uh, pathetic in Iraq mm. and has been uh, for a quite a long time. So that is one reason which basically led people, uh, 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 forced people to come to the streets and demand better governance. The second set of uh, issues were the external interference. Uh, it is a fact that the US military which came in 2003 on and off has been in Iraq despite the fact that there is a popular sentiment against it. Mm. Uh, uh, the, march, the protests in, uh, in 2019 demanded the withdrawal of uh, the US forces and end of all kind of external uh, interference which also included the uh, Iranian uh, interference mm. in Iraqi politics. Mm. So that is the second set of uh, issues. And the third, of course, is the larger uh, uh, political systematic changes which the protesters were demanding, which included the end of the Muhasasa or the sectarian quota system, hmm. which divides the political uh, 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 posts according to the sects uh, in, in, in Iraq. Uh, it also, uh, uh, there was a demand for a, a kind of, some kind of a more accountable gov government, mm. which basically means, as Sadr, during his uh, uh, election victory in 2021, mm. after that, what he tried to do, that a kind of uh, attempt to create a majoritarian uh, government right. instead of a government based on consensus, mm. uh, uh, which the protesters uh, saw, uh, saw as the reason for the widespread corruption and inefficiency in Iraq. So on all these three front fronts, there has been hardly any progress, despite mm. the fact that in the last few months, because of the price, rise in the prices of the oil, uh, uh, so exports has uh, kind of created a surplus uh, of uh, foreign uh, uh, kind of uh, currency. currency in the yeah. country. Yeah. It has created some kind of economic some resources kind of uh, uh, um, uh, among, uh, in the hands of the government. Uh, despite all that, uh, the common Iraqis have not seen uh, better days yeah. yet. And of course, this is a country that was at least on economic indicators leading uh, the, the, the region. Exactly, uh, before, exactly, uh, exactly, before the invasion. Yeah. invasion. All right, thanks very much for both those updates, uh, Abdul, and we'll, of course, see you very soon again on Daily Debrief. And that is also, in fact, a wrap on this episode of the show. We'll, of course, be back with another episode, same time, same place, tomorrow. As always, for more details on these stories and everything else we do, head over to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And don't forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. See you again. Goodbye.